Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thank you. Maybe you're Jim Hart or Logan Larson or Mike Akins or our brand new patron, Clarence. Everybody welcome Woo! Clarence. Yay, Thank you, Clarence. Clarence. On this episode of DTNS, can Microsoft ever regain your trust? A human photographer turns the tables on AI, and Molly Wood tells us if we can make AI green. It's not easy. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, June 14th, 2024, Flag Day. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. And from Oakland, I'm Molly Wood. Drawing the top tech stories, in Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. So how is everyone? Well, I get your not easy being green joke. I see you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sleep deprived because we adopted a two month old puppy oh, yesterday afternoon. Yeah. So if I don't make any sense on this show. Wait a second. Would... Puppies don't sleep just, you know, <laughs> when you want them to. Just whenever you want. It's funny. They sleep a lot. You think that would just cover the spread. But no. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, you did it Puppies to yourself, Tom. We I did. mean, I was thinking we you went from sleep deprived dog life to sleep deprived dog, sleep deprived life. dog life. Yeah. Like, Cause uh, like, old already... dogs also have their own form of sleep deprivation. <laughs> so why not just keep it going? That's what we thought. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, we will get more of that. A good day internet, but let's start with the quick hits. Banana is a game on steam. You click to increase a number and every so often a banana will drop into inventory on steam. Some bananas are common. Some are very rare. So you're allowed to sell in-game items from your Steam inventory on the Steam marketplace. People have been selling their bananas on the Steam marketplace. <laughs> they do nothing but let you rag. I mean, I don't know, maybe you've got some other idea, but it's more of a bragging right that you have a cool banana in your inventory. Most sell for next to nothing, pennies. The special golden banana sold for $1,378.58 on June 9th. The developers get a cut of all bananas sold on the marketplace, as does Steam, and have been selling some bananas directly themselves for 25 cents each. This surprisingly does not involve NFTs in any way. And I know yeah. that's what you were thinking. <laughs> I know. Yeah. But this is just something else entirely. Yeah. And they <laughs> say they might someday turn it into a game. But right now, it's just bananas that yeah. you click and get. Bananas. So, this is go. the worst yeah. timeline. <laughs> it's a bananas timeline. Ah. The Arc browser has a new feature getting some love from browser enthusiasts. Uh, Live Calendar presents your next Google Calendar meeting in the sidebar. The sidebar is one of the big things at Arc. Uh, so your next meeting shows up in the sidebar shortly before the meeting starts and has a little countdown timer as well as a button to join the meeting if it's a Google Meet. All without opening the calendar tab in your browser. That's why people seem to like it. All you need to do to activate it is open calendar in a tab in Arc, log in, and then drag it to the favorites section under the URL. The Irish Data Protection Commission, which has jurisdiction over Meta's activities in the EU, has asked Meta to provide information on how it used store user data, how it used user data to train its generative models. As a result, Meta will delay its plan launched of Meta AI in the EU. OpenAI said it has added a former head of the U.S. National Security Agency, retired General Paul Nakasone, to its board of directors. Uh, OpenAI recently disbanded its more long-term thinking safety and security committee and replaced it with one focused on near-term issues. This new one is only made up of board members. Uh, Nakasone, now being a board member, uh, is going to immediately join the new safety and security committee as well. Uh, he led the U.S. military's cyber command at one point and is generally praised for his security expertise. Repair technician and consumer privacy advocate Louis Rossman notes that Sonos changed its privacy policy in the United States, removing a sentence that previously stated Sonos does not and will not sell personal information about our customers. That pledge is still present in Sonos's privacy policy in other countries, just not the U.S. Hmm, Sonos hmm. still hasn't talked about it as of this recording. 
Well, the saga of Microsoft's recall feature has hit a lull. Microsoft is pausing the rollout altogether, although they will give it to beta testers. Uh, if you're new to the Microsoft recall saga, I'll, I promise this will be quick. Uh, recall is the feature that will take a regular screenshot of your machine and then use that screenshots or uh, that collection of screenshots to feed an on-device model that can answer questions about your own data. Like, what was that blue dress I saw? Or when's my mom coming? Stuff like that. Microsoft has changed how it works to be encrypted, not just on the drive, but in the database actually being encrypted itself and require biometrics like Windows Hello, uh, particularly, to gain access to the feature. You can't open recall without having your Windows Hello biometric authentication. It will also be opt in with a question asked during setup, do you want this or not? And uh, it already could exclude certain things if you want. So it doesn't have to record everything for you to use it. Now, it was supposed to launch a public preview with Copilot Plus branded PCs, but it won't. Microsoft wants to continue to test it with the Windows Insider users in preview. So that's basically beta. Microsoft said it will post to its blog when the feature is available in preview. Uh, this comes coincidentally after Microsoft Vice Chair and President Brad Smith told the U.S. Homeland Security Committee that Microsoft is placing security as its top priority, including making it a mandatory part of employee reviews. Now, with solar winds and other breaches and the recall backlash and the backpedaling and the deciding, you know what, actually, let's make sure we get this right before we force it onto a bunch of laptops and being called in front of Congress, uh, it's evident that a lot of people don't trust Microsoft. I've heard directly from many of you that your problem with recall wasn't even how recall worked. It's that you just don't trust Microsoft. Uh, Molly, is Microsoft doing the right things here or is trust just gone? I mean, trust is such a fragile little leaf in the wind, you know, and we have yeah. seen over and over that when it kind of flies out the door like this, it is very tough to get back with consumers who know better. So I feel like that's sort of an important caveat. I mean, it is not reassuring that Microsoft is now deciding not to do a bunch of things that were already terrible policy in the first place, like roll this thing out without really testing it and not telling people what it was and making it opt uh, out by default. And now saying like, oh, it'll be opt in instead, right? It's like, wait, so you did everything wrong up until wh whatever, 19 hours ago even in the face of these ongoing security breaches. And that is the kind of behavior that's so baked in and hard to change over time. That's cultural. I mean, the, the having something be like, this is a new awesome feature. You're all going to love it. But for if some reason you don't love it or don't want to use it, you know, you can opt out. I mean, when, when, Will the companies learn right. that doing that is the way to just upset everybody and and maybe almost unrealistically upset them? It's because, you know, having a feature that is opt in, great. You know, maybe I'll I'll check it out. Mm -hmm. But having it be something that I have to opt out of that that makes people insane every yeah. single time. And it's always shady. It always makes you look shady. Like it's yeah, just like it makes it, you look this, shady, even if you're not. Right. Whether you are or not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh. It's just it it's such a simple thing to be like, just opt into this. You know, marketing team, go ham. Make sure everybody knows what they're opting into and it's going mm -hmm. to be the best feature ever. And look, just I don't understand. Don't make them opt out. I understand a marketing team wanting to opt people in because if you ask them, they'll probably opt out and you want to juice your numbers. Uh, course, Microsoft yeah. didn't need to make people opt in for this nope. to work. There's there was I didn't see the big advantage in not asking people other than like, well, it'll smooth up the setup a little bit, make setup go faster. Uh, and so maybe somebody had that as a metric on their employee review. But uh, yeah, there, there, there's nothing to lose by asking people, hey, Microsoft Recall will do this. Would you like to turn it on or not? Which right. is what they're doing now. Um, I, I thought a lot of the backlash against recall was unwarranted because a lot of it was, I don't want Microsoft knowing this. And Microsoft was never going to know this. That's one thing they did right was this was all on device and it was all encrypted on the hard drive. So Microsoft was never going to see your data. A lot of people said, I don't trust that that's true. That's a totally different situation. In that case, maybe you probably shouldn't even use Windows, but right. uh, don't use that, computers. Yeah, that's, that's different. 
what was bad is that you could get to that database uh, pretty easily if you could get into the account. And they fixed that and said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna secure the account. We didn't think it was that big a risk, <laughs> which I think was wrong, but they did that right. I just, I think there's, it's interesting to see Microsoft has gone through the, like they were the evil empire, then they were the underdog and people kind of liked them again. And now the tide seems to have turned again. I will say I would be wary of, I'm not sure how much the tide, I mean, again, this is where I say consumers who know better, right? You're, yeah, of sure. course, Tom is going to hear from people who don't trust Microsoft. And there are going to be plenty of people. And, and this is where it's kind of like, guys, this is just an own goal. There's no reason not to take a, a page from Apple here and sort of say like, here's this thing we're going to do that if any other company tried to do it, it, or you found out that it was just a default, a new default option on your device, you would lose your minds and have a complete privacy freak out. But if Microsoft came along and there was a pop-up and it said, hey, we can now do this, this, and this, and would you like to enable it? And you could choose it for to only be your browser or only be your email or none of those, people would be like, hot damn, this convenience is amazing and I would love to do it. And I suspect that much like we've seen over the decades, when any sort of privacy invading thing comes out, if it's convenient enough, people aren't going to care. Yeah. It, 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 it's unfortunately true. Uh, and yet the section of the audience that does know yeah. did get Microsoft to change some stuff about this. Which is great. So that should happen. I think the, the power of the crowds is, is working. It it works more than we like to give it credit for. And I think oh, this is an example Oh, it absolutely does. I think the yeah. sad thing is like, why don't companies, why haven't they learned that yet? Why haven't <laughs> they learned that? You know what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, the opt out is, is just one example of that. You know, it's going to happen now, granted every once in a while you can opt people in and everyone wants to be opted in and that's fine, mm -hmm. but you got to have a hundred percent or, or nigh upon for, for you to opt in to people like, yeah, that's fine. We, we want that. Uh, and those, those are non-controversial. If you think it's going to be controversial in any tiny way, don't opt people in. It's just, it's just not worth just it. that simple. Well, the 1839 Color Photography Awards uh, created a new special category in 2024 for AI-generated photos. Miles Astray, the photographer, submitted a what was considered a surreal photo of a flamingo with its head tucked in on a white sand beach, real cute feet, in this category, and won third place from the judges as well as the People's Voice Award, Vote Award, rather. However... He has been disqualified and his award has since been taken away because it turns out Astray took the picture himself and did not use generative AI models to make it at all. Astray told Petapixel in an email, I wanted to show that nature is still going to beat the machine and that there is still merit in real work from real creatives. Okay, so uh, we got an artist saying I'm trying to make a point about, you know, just being a photographer, you got a camera, sometimes you still win against the AI machine. But um, <laughs> I, I, I had to laugh a little bit because he could have, um, <clears throat> the artist could have uh, entered this into any other category just happened to be the AI category. So, you know, you've got some, you've got some photographers and artists making a statement here. Yeah, it's a troll. It's a really successful troll. I'm kind of with Howard Yermish in the chat who says, I think that I love this. <laughs> like, I, you know, I mean, look, I appreciate a good troll and this was a good troll. It does point to a startling inability. I mean, it does point to a lack of tools for identifying AI images. And that's the one thing that makes me a little nervous. I'm like, wait, do we, are we not developing in addition, in, in, in correlation with tools that can create AI images? Are we not equally developing tools that can detect them? Because apparently well, like nobody well, ran and, this through a machine. <laughs> and uh, of, of the folks in the group um, who are part of uh, 1839 Color Photography Awards as the judges. They come from the New York Times, Getty Images, Fade on Press, Christie's, Maddox Gallery, among others. Uh, none apparently could know that Astray's photo wasn't indeed AI generated. Yeah, the problem yeah. here is we need to be able to detect human generated images. Yeah, 
Yeah. Was right. that Sarah? Well, either way, right? I mean, it, he, what he did, weirdly, is yeah. create, and, created and like a zero day. They did eventually find out and disqualify him. So, you know, it, yeah. it, it, it did it did work out in the end that it was detected. Well, uh, and, and to, yeah. to the organizer's credit, I guess, uh, you know, they said uh, after this, each category has distinct criteria that entrance images must meet. His submission did not meet the requirements for the AI generated image category. In other words, wasn't made of AI. We oh, understand that was the point, but we don't want to prevent other artists from their shot at winning in the AI category. So yeah, they're basically saying like great photo of the flamingo man. Yeah. But get you know, why did you put it in AI? Yeah. I, it, it's actually an incredibly practical response of like, yes, we understand you're making a statement. This is the wrong category. Sorry. We had to disqualify. Yeah. And we're going to take your just, award away. You know, yeah. yeah. Like, but he did um, identify, I do think it's a very successful troll that identifies lots of issues. Like one, if you're going to have an AI photography competition, it's sort of like name this boat, right? And then you didn't think that Reddit was going to hit you with Bodie McBoatface. Like, <laughs> You're going to have an AI photography <laughs> competition and one, you don't think that real photographers are going to try to troll you because they're mad and threatened about AI photography, but two, well, now we do. Me, you're not going <laughs> to use AI to identify the AI photos. Like there, what? there, there have been a That's ton there. So first of all, it's not an AI contest. It's a, it's a photography contest. And a lot of these kinds of contests are creating an AI category because the opposite has been happening, right? People are trying to sneak their AI created images into the regular categories. Exactly. And they're, they're exactly. like, you know what? Fine. We'll, give you your own category uh and so this is the first time since they've been doing that i just don't think they contemplated that a human would try to sneak into the ai because they've spent all of their brain power trying to stop the ai images right. from showing up in the human ones so our two story these back-to-back -back stories are really both stories about failure to anticipate obvious results mm, no. <laughs> also i uh i said this to sarah earlier today if i was writing a novel and I named the character who did this in my novel Miles Astray, the editor would tell me that was too on the nose. Also that. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, great catch. you know what? We all have our own monikers. Yeah. Uh, it's a great I name. I don't really even know what mine is. Well Super suited to the moment. think about that over the weekend. Yeah. But, Super yeah. great photo, though, I will say. Really cool picture. It's a great photo. So I mean, cool. Good, good for you, Mr. Hey, Astray. Yeah. Let's give a little credit to the flamingo, too, right? Yeah, I mean, I can't. That's a real that. flamingo. <laughs> just made it's, it's. You know what? That's actually very. That's a, that's a very good point, Tom. It's not just about the photographer; it's about the model. Don't forget the model. And the flamingo was serving. Yeah, everyone so. wants to leave out the talent. Flamingo's yeah. giving me. <laughs> I yeah. can't. I'm no, like, stop. I'm like, I'm the one sitting up here all day. Says the flamingo. You know, I bring up a foot. You know. <laughs> yeah. It's never Where me. is that flamingo's head? Freezing. Is I he on the snow? They, they, no, no. It, it, it's just like in the um, in in like a white sand beach. Right. I right, kind of right. get why you might think it was generated because you know. It's oh, not it looks the like it. Traditional flamingo because it's so cute situation. and yeah. super right? surreal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Miles astray, amazing. Well, if you're sitting here thinking, Tom. That's great. You're doing a great job, you know, riding the balance, being all objective. What do you really <laughs> think about all this stuff? Uh, I have a newsletter for you where I give my actual opinions. I'll be honest, they're not that different than the ones here. Uh, but it's just me and it's in your inbox every morning. If you'd like to get your tech news from me that way, I've been doing a free preview all week. Uh, so you can go look at all the issues from this week, Monday through Friday, absolutely free. Normally, the free tech newsletter is free on Thursday, and if you upgrade, you get it Monday through Friday. But this week, it was free all week for everybody. So all five of them are out now. Go check them out at freetechnewsletter.com. A Nikkei Asia article cites an estimate that single chat GPT queries use 50 to 90 times more electricity than a traditional Google search. And researchers at Hugging Face and Carnegie Mellon universities have found that regenerating one image with a generative model can use as much energy as 522 smartphone charges. Um, so, yeah. I think we all know they use a lot of energy. This week on Everybody in the Pool, Molly talked to Megan Lorenzen from Salesforce about its newly announced sustainable AI principles, which are aimed at pushing the industry to consider energy use in AI alongside other issues like privacy, copyright, security, deepfakes, and so on. Uh, Molly, 
can companies really keep such huge power use sustainable? I think, I mean, this is such a fascinating development, not least of which because they're actually calling for it regulation, right? Or future regulation to include environmental use. I think though that the answer is that these companies will have to try to make this energy use more sustainable. And by sustainable, I mean affordable. Like it's just not tenable. I mean, I think you could really make the argument that a significant number of the Google layoffs we've seen recently were literal sacrifices to the machine, to the sheer cost of the hardware and compute power that it takes to keep building and training these models. And so I think this is sort of a one of those things where you can potentially do good in order to do well or survive in the AI race at all. Yeah, I imagine there's a lot of folks out there skeptical that that you could run these models in data centers in any way that would keep energy use uh, sustainable. Uh, what is Salesforce recommending that, that other companies do? Yeah, so the, what they're saying is that we should consider a, a framework for future regulation that takes into account energy use, that there should be standardized metrics for evaluating energy use because right now there there really aren't right there's just this kind of these like hugging face uh estimates and each company yeah, yeah. sort of knows what their electric bill is so to speak um but they're not necessarily saying so that that first we would need this standardized metric for evaluating how much energy it takes to train a model then use those metrics to hone in on uh models that exceed a certain amount of energy use and classify them as higher risk or like systemic risk from a, a climate and greenhouse gas emissions perspective, and then create some standards for what they're calling right sizing AI models, because not every, you know, there's a tendency to create a model with more data than you need, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, use models that have access to everything on the internet when maybe all you really need is models that have access to like every kind of banana. And so <laughs> in that case, just train the model on banana types. Don't yeah. train it on everything in the world and then ask it to retrieve you information about banana types. Yeah. Okay. So this makes sense to me as far as it goes, which is, uh, first of all, let's figure out how to compare bananas to bananas, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let's have a standard. So we actually know what's being used and, and can talk about it in a useful way. That That's always a good idea. Uh, the, the other two methods that you talked about are very much in the let's conserve, let's be efficient. Some of that's just smart business sense, right? Because exactly. it's going to save, save you money at the same time. Yep. Uh, and and let's let's figure out what we really need to do and what we really don't. Now, whenever a company recommends regulation, I always go and look like, okay, what kind of regulatory lock-in might benefit that company? Did you see anything like this in these recommendations where it's like, oh, Salesforce wants this because they're good at it and maybe a competitor wouldn't be? I mean, Salesforce is one of the very few companies that is running its operations on 100% renewable energy. So, and those operations include a crap ton of data centers, right? Because Salesforce is a cloud services provider. So, sort of, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I do think, you know, this is this is a thing that I talked with Salesforce about, as you mentioned in the episode of Everybody in the Pool that posted today. And the the write up, the intro to this was like, look. When people talk about climate action, they say, oh, it doesn't matter what I do. It only matters what big companies do. And then a big company does something and we go, I'm, that's baloney. I don't believe I don't believe anything they say. They've got yeah, some yeah. reason to. Right. So so it's kind of like, well, look, if we want big companies to take positive action around climate, then we have to figure out a metric maybe for identifying the ones who are doing it in the right way. And Salesforce is one of a, is one of really very few, like a teeny, teeny handful of companies that has achieved this 100% renewable energy power goal and has had it as a part of its sort of mission from the beginning to push for industry-wide practices around sustainability. So mm. it benefits them. It benefits anybody who runs a bunch of data centers. If everybody else is, is doing things the same way, Salesforce is probably also looking for any kind of edge they can get because sure. I, even among tech giants, they're extremely small. Um, but I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent skeptical of the idea that we need to have uh, this conversation in the industry. Yeah. I mean, look, I don't think any regulations coming from the U.S. anyway. 
<laughs> but if there's going to be regulation on AI, then absolutely, I would love for it to take into account energy use because yeah. It's so really it's, it sounds like you're not seeing an alarm bell of like, oh, sure, they want that because then no one else will be able to achieve it. And they, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it keeps competitors out or anything. Yeah, like that. it doesn't. I don't think there's a really yeah. a competitive lockout to a more efficient energy usage other than maybe rules that say you can't just keep training bigger and bigger and bigger AI models. But then you could argue yeah. that maybe that just saves humanity, too. So like, yay. The one thing I was curious about, and I, I don't have anything against any of these principles, but it doesn't address energy generation, uh, which again, Salesforce doesn't control. So that makes sense that they, they wouldn't be playing on that side. But what well, about that side of like, well, but also if we created more sustainable energy sources, that would help. Absolutely. And that's where that's where in getting to the 100 percent renewable energy use Salesforce and th there's a there's actually a coalition of companies that uh -huh. they work with that includes Amazon and Meta and like Akamai and a couple Intel and a couple others. And what they have done is to attempt to not only. So the way companies get to net zero in this way, right, is that they fund renewable energy projects and then they get credit, renewable energy credit. It's like an offset thing. But what this or what this coalition of companies does is also say, we're not just going to put up solar projects in California, where there are already a ton of solar projects, we're going to incentivize the building of solar farms or wind farms in, let's say, developing countries or the global south, so that they get the benefit of renewable energy in those companies, it displaces what otherwise would have been a coal plant. Yeah. And in generates economic development in those countries as well. And creates more renewable energy globally to power these data centers. This is the way it's sort of like Bitcoin, right? Like the argument that people would give you about crypto uh, using so much energy was, well, people are going to figure out how to do this with renewable energy because it's the cheapest electrons on the planet. It's just a, like a power law thing. You need it to be cheaper or else you can't do it. And so I actually think from this perspective, seeking renewable sources of energy to power data centers is just the only economic way forward. Yeah. So yeah, because uh, un unlike crypto, uh, unlike many crypto enterprises, uh, data centers are a thing that are actually happening and generating revenue right. for companies. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sick uh, burn, Tom. Didn't see that sense. coming. Yeah, <laughs> some I said, some. maybe most. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Uh, for those of us who have airline points. Uh, burning a hole in your pocket. Uh, you want more information on what your options are in order to have that next flight. Chris Christensen has us covered. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. If you are a frequent flyer or collect frequent flyer points, either through flying or through credit cards that provide you with frequent flyer points, you may wonder how you can use them. And you may be looking for opportunities, the best way to use them. One resource is seats.aero, A-E-R-O. And with seats.aero, you can search for particular routes or you can say, I have points on this particular system. So for I can say I have United mileage points, for instance. And then I can look for if I want to fly from, say, North America to Europe, then what kind of opportunities are available? How much are various routes going to cost me with miles? And I can search for my particular airport near me. So it's a good way to figure out if there are some deals available. The site again is seats.aero, A-E-R-O. And this is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Not gonna lie, when I first saw seats.aero, I could have I would have bet it was one of those like get an empty seat on a private jet going somewhere. So I was kind of, I was kind of uh I was kind of surprised and and uh interested when I'm like, oh no, this is something I can use. <laughs> Excellent. Man, I wish I'd had this like two weeks ago when I was booking the world's most complicated summer vacation. Oh, right. Awesome. Yeah. Well, it's mm. uh for the for the next time. Next time. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and then Tim wrote in, because uh, on Wednesday we were talking about uh, podcast apps and Sherlocking uh, in Good Day Internet in the extended show. Uh, and Tim said that discussion made me laugh because of my ironic experience with iOS integration. I was perfectly happy with Apple Podcasts until I started trying to leave the phone at home and listen directly from my watch on a regular basis. I struggled to get Apple Podcasts to sync with the watch reliably, yet somehow Overcast just works without any special effort on my part. I think it's weird that the third-party app integrates better with the first-party developer's own hardware, but whatever. I just want to listen to GDI <laughs> unencumbered, so I'll do whatever works. Oh, Tim, thank you for taking one for 
the, our team. Yes, indeed, indeed. Yeah. And it, it goes to show that just attempting to Sherlock does not always successfully Sherlock an app. Uh, thank you, Len Peralta, for being with us today. I know you've been busy illustrating today's topics. Uh, what have you drawn for us? You know, you mentioned topics. So occasionally on the show, there will be multiple topics I could draw. And uh, this was one of them. Uh, you know, uh, in what other show can you talk about headless flamingos, bananas, and green AI? And what do they have to do with one another? No. Uh, and that's, this is the image that I came up with. <laughs> it's, that's a little bit weird, I understand. Uh, but, you know, what's interesting about this image is that in, in the 10-plus ten, ten ten well, years... I know, it is a little bit weird. It's a little uh, weird, but in, weird. In the 10-plus years that I've been yeah. doing this show with you, Tom, I don't think I've ever done, like, a promo for it where it says, listen to today's oh. Daily Tech News show to find out. So it's a little <laughs> promo there. Um, that would be incredible. It is, that yeah, would I win know. the AI photo contest. A after... <laughs> After I drew That's it, that's actually like, a very good promo. Well, you want to know what this means? You listen to Daily Tech. <laughs> Just listen show. to the show. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are, um, if you're interested in purchasing this, you can get it at my Patreon, patreoncom forward slash Len, or at my online store, LenPeraltaStore.com, where I am taking commissions. So if you're looking for some art for something coming up, say a Father's Day, which is a little bit too late for Father's Day, or even graduations because they're still going on, give me a give me a holler. I'd love to help you out. And I need to uh, juice up my uh, PayPal account. You know what yeah, I'm saying? So, banana juice. <laughs> banana juice. Uh, mm -hmm. So there you go. Thank you so much. You know, uh, the, the banana game on Steam is taking submissions for new banana designs. Oh, what? Really? Dude, oh, send so in the bingo. <laughs> Come on. How about the, the yeah, the bingo? Born for it. Born for it. <laughs> Banana Mingo. Uh, well, Len, as always, you surprise and delight us. So, uh, <laughs> thank, thank you. I'm you. so happy to hear that. <laughs> thank you again. <laughs> Molly Wood, also so, so happy to have you on the show today. Let folks know where they can keep up with your latest. So fun to be here. Thank you, everybody. Everybodyinthepool.com is where you can find the website and subscribe to the newsletter and keep up on the show. Excellent. Go Appreciate do it, folks. You. Do it right now. Do uh, it. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. It's Friday Quiz Day, and as I mentioned at the top of the show, it's Flag Day in the United States. So Roger Chang has devised a quiz all about flags, from oh, penance man, to software flags. Oh, no. All oh, no. Stick around Great. and watch us suffer. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Just a reminder, uh, we do the show, uh, TTNS is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Thanks to everybody who joins us live. Tell a friend if you think they might enjoy it as well. We'll be back on Monday with Justin Robert Young joining us. Until then, have a great weekend, everyone. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host, Rob Dunwood. Video producer, Joe Kuntz. Producer at large, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, WS Goddess One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, aka Gadget Virtuoso and JD Galloway. Modern video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows include Nika Monford, Terrence Gaines, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, Molly Wood, and Chris Christensen. Our guest this week was Cody Sudin. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>